it's one thing being able to study in lots of martial arts, but it's another thing to understand the criteria of which is important. Hello, thanks for tuning in. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 436. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Mr. James Wilkes. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for this show, the founder of Whistlekick, and I really love martial arts. And that's why we bring you this show twice a week. And that's why we do so many other things. In fact, if you want to check out all the other things that we do, you can visit whistlekick.com. You can find links to all the projects that we do, including this show, as well as our store. We've got apparel and protective equipment, uniforms, a whole bunch of stuff for your martial arts training or your martial arts lifestyle. And if you use the code PODCAST15, that's going to get you 15% off every single thing in that store. If you want the show notes, you can find those at a separate site, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got links and photos, videos, transcripts, all kinds of stuff over there. And sign up for the newsletter while you're there. We've got some cool stuff that comes out in the newsletter, stuff you don't find anywhere else. Depending on the circles you roll in, you may have heard of today's guest. He's achieved some pretty outstanding things in the world of combat, and now he's dedicated his life to something else. Now, I'm not going to give any of this away, but just know, this episode, we talk about stuff that we've never talked about on Martial Arts Radio, stuff that I really enjoyed having a conversation about, and I hope you enjoy listening. So here we go. Mr. Wilkes, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Oh, thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. And, you know, this is, uh, I, I suspect this one's going to be a little different. And, and that's fun for me to say as the host that here we are, four plus years in, 400 and something episodes, and we still find martial artists with stories that are different, things that, that a lot of us haven't experienced, paths that are, I don't want to say unique, but non-traditional. And I think that we're going to end up with one of those today. It's just, I'm, if I was a betting man, which I'm not, I would bet that. So thanks for being here. Thanks for giving us that opportunity. Oh, yeah. I'm excited to be here. Well, good. Good. We start in a pretty generic way, a way that, you know, you might expect. It's a martial arts show. We talk about martial arts. So let me throw you the ball. How did you get started with martial arts? So very early on, my uncle was a high ranked karate fighter in the UK. Uh, my dad uh, was studied Kung Fu. And then my grandfather was actually, it's alleged that he faked his birth certificate to get into World War II so he could fight, you know, against the Germans. And so I think um, fighting was really in the blood of the family. And then martial arts, um, you know, was obviously an extension of that. And so it sort of just led naturally to me into starting, uh, starting karate. And then from there, you know, I was really watching a lot of the Bruce Lee films, and that really inspired me to, to, to keep going. So you, you start because of a, a family, we'll say, predisposition, maybe, maybe some pressure there. But yeah, yeah. you stuck yeah. around. You kept training. That's right. And was think, that because of family pressure too, or did you find something in your training that resonated with you? Well, no, early on, I don't think I was that keen when I was sort of eight years old and my dad was putting me in karate, didn't really want to be there. Um, but once I started watching, you know, the, the Bruce Lee films that really inspired me and that's why I you know, really stuck to it. Mm. Which was your first Bruce Lee film? I think it was Enter the Dragon, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of bunch of great ones, big, the big boss and um, so forth, but into the dragon, you know, was my first. And what was it about Bruce Lee? Do you remember? But most people and, and, you know, the majority of episodes have Bruce Lee mentioned at some point. I mean, we, we, <laughs> it's hard to be a martial artist and not talk about Bruce Lee, despite how long he's been gone. But I find this fascinating that most of us remember our first Bruce Lee movie and how we felt when we first saw him on screen. Yeah, I mean, he was so dynamic, so powerful. Um, you know, the moves were so impressive. And uh, taking on multiple opponents, you know, I thought it was very cool that someone could defend themselves. You know, at that age, I, you know, I thought it was all real, right? So I thought, <laughs> but uh, later came to realize there's very different sides of Bruce Lee, so the movie personality and then his real approach to combat. But um, yeah, at the time, you know, it was very flashy, looked very cool and uh, really inspirational. And where did your martial journey go from there? Did you keep training or? Yeah, I mean, I studied karate for, for, for a while. And then at, um, 
think about 15, I started doing Taekwondo. I went to a different uh, school and started doing that. And then what happened, I think I was, you know, around that age when I got, um, I got into a fight on the street and I got beaten up and I started realizing that all those routines and the cutters and everything that I'd learned in the past really weren't doing me any good. And that's when I really started looking into, you know, Bruce Lee's philosophy his search for truth in combat. You know, he would say, research your own experience, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, add what is specifically your own. And I started realizing the difference between, you know, moves that looked really good and those which were practical. So that's when I started opening my horizons, starting reading, you know, various books, looking at different styles, realizing that, you know, you need to incorporate grappling. And that's where it really took off for me. And I started studying as much as possible and training more. Mm. Now, it's certainly not uncommon for people to train and then find that in some way that art or some aspect of their training fails them. It, it could happen as it did with you. In a confrontation on the street, it could be in personal exchanges with their instructors or, or other students. Quite often, we start out with martial arts and somebody tells us, this is all you need to know. This, is, this school, this style, everything here, this is 100% of what you'll need. And of course, that's almost never the case. And we'll, we'll carve out some exception for something rare that I've not experienced, but we need more. We need to diversify. And so you went on this this mission to do that fairly young, younger than most people would do that. And again, you turned to Bruce Lee. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, like you said, every style has something that's useful, right? But some styles have more use than others. Um, I think a lot of stuff's been watered down, obviously. And, you know, a lot of it's become commercialized. So the whole belt system is really a commercialization. Um, not, not saying there's not benefits to that as well, having a belt system. But it's really about keeping those students and it becomes a lot about money and keeping your school going. And so, you know, I think some of the, some, a lot of the martial arts are watered down. People don't like getting hit. Um, you know, they don't want to put in the hard work and the effort. And so <clears throat> with, to commercialize, you know, you've got to soften things up, I think, for a lot of people. And that's sort of diminished the effectiveness of a lot of these arts. Um, mm. But essentially, yeah, and just starting looking at Bruce Lee and realizing that you've got to pick and choose, not just eclectically, like a bit from here and there, but synergistically to see how those different arts and different techniques work together. Mm, yeah. So here you are, you're still fairly young, and you're, you're leaning into some of Bruce Lee's philosophies. What did you do with that information? How, you, you said you continued training and, and expanded your training, but what did that look like? So, well, but, you know, I kept studying the Taekwondo and then at, at the time there was nothing very close by. So I would take opportunities, for example, there's a man by the name of Jeff Thompson who would, um, who was really looking, he was a doorman in Coventry in England. And uh, he would really, you know, he'd sort of taken the same approach, building in different uh, techniques from different styles. He also had something called Animal Day, where it was sort of an all out, it was sort of like a, an MMA fight, but they would even allow um, biting to the release, not to bite through the skin, hitting the groin, that sort of thing. So I remember going there when I was 17 and getting my uh, Taekwondo gi just ripped off within seconds. Um, you know, I never experienced that before because you didn't really grapple in Taekwondo. And there was maybe a few takedowns where they grabbed the gi. Um, but, you know, I hadn't experienced that. And that was another uh, sort of awakening moment, like, hey, I've really got to pick this up. So I was studying a little bit from books and things like that. I didn't really have many places to train except for occasionally going to um, see Jeff Thompson's um, group. But uh, then when I was 18, you know, I went away to university and that's where I really started bringing in lots of different arts. So I started studying Japanese jiu-jitsu, kickboxing, Wing Chun, um, you know, and that eventually led me down to the sort of Jun Fang Kung Fu uh, and Jeet Kune Do path as well. Mm. Mm. And, you know, I, th I think if we roll back five minutes and took bets on what martial art would this individual end up at Jeet Kune Do would, would make sense just the way you're talking about Bruce Lee. So what was your experience? How did you first find Jeet Kune Do and what did it feel like when you did? Well, I, you know, I came across the, the book, the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, Bruce Lee's, you know, book. He wrote a lot of it while he was injured with his back injury in bed, but you know, it was a conglomeration of all of his notes. And um, I think that, that book right there was sort of very instrumental in laying out 
you know, the, uh, the principle, he would say, research your own experience, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, and add what is specifically your own, as I said. And um, that really set as a guideline for all of my arts moving forward. So it's one thing being able to study in lots of martial arts, but it's another thing to understand the criteria of which is important. So if you don't understand the immutable principles of combat, for example, risk to reward ratio or economy of motion, these things you have to take into account. So you look through that lens when you're studying in these different classes. Don't just take what the instructor says for granted, but rather have an analytical eye and look at those immutable principles and think, does this fit in? Is this technique economical? You know, is that for the risk that I do, for example, if I do a spinning back kick to the head, what is my risk there on the street? Well, a wrestler could grab my leg, pick me up, slam me on the floor, and my head smashes on the ground. What is my reward? Well, sure, sometimes you can knock people out with a spinning you know, hook kick to the head, but most of the time it doesn't. It just sort of hits the person, and if they're tough, it sort of pisses them off, and then you know, they, uh, they, they pick you up and smash you on the ground again. So <laughs> if you compare that to, say, like an eye, eye jab, or I actually put an eye slap, or uh, you know, a quick jab to the face, the risk there is pretty minimal, whereas the reward, if you land a good shot, can be pretty high. So keeping in mind those principles when learning new techniques. And that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it, you know, in, in business, I tend to think of it as opportunity cost. Right. But you're talking about the exact same thing. And I'll, I'll confess, I've thought of it, but I haven't thought of it in quite the way that you're expressing it. So where did, is this stuff that you started to reason out yourself or did this come from one of the, the books or, or an instructor? Yeah, it was a combination really, I think of Bruce Lee's writings and then my own thoughts. Um, you know, a lot of thoughts that I'd had in parallel um, before reading some of Bruce Lee's stuff. So it just really resonated with me when I saw it in there as well. Because he was really, I feel, ahead of his time in terms of analyzing it. And a lot of people know Bruce Lee as the movie star, but they don't really know that, you know, in terms of mixed martial arts, um, not just the sport, but really synergistically combining those, he was really, you know, ahead of his time. Mm. Yeah. And where did you go from there? So, you know, I studied at uh, martial arts in, in college. I was studying more, spending more time. I was at the Bournemouth, uni, uh, University of Bournemouth in England. And, you know, during that four years, uh, I spent more time studying martial arts than I did for my degree. And uh, when, when I, I graduated there with a Bachelor of Science degree, I, I came to the US and I thought it would just be for six months and then I'd go back and get a job. So I came out to train with Paul Vunak, who developed the rapid assault tactics, which were in the 90s and early 2000s was the combat program for the US Navy SEALs. So I came out to train with Paul. He was also um, the protege of Dan and Asanto, which was Bruce Lee's main training partner. And so I'd occasionally go up and train with Ben Asanto as well at the uh, Inosanto Academy in LA, but primarily I was training with Paul Vunek, um, studying under him and training with him and, and helping him teach as well. And, you know, after a few months, I really liked it here in the States. And, um, you know, the weather was great. The martial arts training was better. At the time in the UK, there was literally only one uh, Gracie, there was only one Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, uh, Mauricio Mato Gomez. And uh, he was the only, you know, so I'd never really experienced jujitsu like this, Brazilian jujitsu. And so it was just great training here in Orange County, California with uh, the jujitsu, with the Jeet Kune Do and Chun Fan Kung Fu. And, um, you know, decided to stay basically. And here I am 19 years later. <laughs> still haven't, uh, you know, I go back obviously to see family once a year or twice a year, but, you know, I'm still here in, in the US. Mm. Okay. And, most people that end up with martial arts as their overarching passion tend to lean into some aspect of it. You know, you've got people who are really passionate about forms or people who are passionate about teaching or, I mean, we've had people on the, on the show who have been trickers and breakers and movie stars and martial arts can lead us into so many places. Where is it taking you? Well, I think, you know, a couple of things, some of the things that I've really feel like I've gained from it is I, I love the, the, the challenge, the physical challenge, the game of chess, if you will, especially, you know, with jujitsu, which I present jujitsu and, and grappling, combat submission wrestling, those are my favorite sort of styles to practice. So that's, I think, you know, I really appreciate the, the, the challenge that it's given me. I think it's made me a stronger person and allowed me to take on more challenges in other areas. I mean, if you're used to getting punched in the face and kicked and need 
everything else in life should be uh, a little bit easier, right? Um, yeah. And so, you know, I think I've, I've really, martial arts has given me, you know, like you said earlier, we were talking about this opportunity cost in business. I think the principles in, of combat, when you really understand them, help in other areas of life. So I think that's been extremely helpful. And then, you know, I think, um, you know, where I'm at now, this sort of research for truth in combat, this sort of mindset and this ability to critically think has also uh, taken me on this journey of um, the search for truth in nutrition. You know, I got injured, started um, looking into nutrition for optimal recovery and performance. And I took that same mindset of the search for truth in combat and applied that to the search for truth in nutrition to become, to recover quicker, to become a better athlete, to become healthier. Hmm. Have you always been research driven? I mean, was school something you were passionate about in this way? No, I was never really um, passionate in school. I did like uh, mathematics, but most subjects I didn't really care for. I'm research driven when it comes to an area in which I'm interested. So if you know, I'm going to school and people are telling me what to think and what to do, I'm not really that keen. Um, but you know, I think when it comes to a subject I'm really interested in, then I really want to read about it and want to study. Mm, that makes sense. So tell us about this injury. So I was actually um, sparring with a future heavyweight champion in the UFC. So he had about 80 or 90 pounds on me, Fabricio Vadum. And uh, we were sparring. And I, I tore ligaments in both of my knees. I, he went and did a flying knee, took me off the ground. I landed in some sweat. Um, he sort of sprawled down top of me. And so his way and my way went through my knees. And uh, the sweat stopped and my feet stopped and uh, tore ligaments in both of my knees. So I thought, well, how can I really you know, heal as quickly as possible. I, you know, I was training for a fight um, and wanted to just get back to it as soon as possible. So that's when I really started digging into nutrition. Mm. And what did you find? Well, the, one of the first things I came across was a study about the Roman gladiators. So an, scientists analyzed the bones and, um, of 68 gladiator skeletons, 5,000 bones, and they could tell they were eating almost exclusively plants. And I thought, well, that can't be true because you've got to have meat and you know, uh, other animal products to be strong and to be healthy, to have strong bones, to have strong muscles. So I just started really digging into the research and started traveling around interviewing the head of nutrition at Harvard, the head of anthropology at Harvard, world's leading uh, researchers looking out, looking for the best um, researchers on the planet and also digging into peer reviewed research. And sure enough, it came across that it was a complete myth that we needed meat and animal protein to be, to be strong and healthy. Now, I'm sure there are some people listening who just instantly dismissed that. Mm -hmm. And I, I have my own background. I'm not going to let that come through here. This is, this is about you know, your story, your discovery, your path. So what would you say to them? Would give, maybe, maybe give us a little bit more about why it's not necessary. Yeah, totally. I mean, I definitely believe that myself before um, really started digging into the research and found that, you know, some of the interesting things that stood out to me is that all protein originates in plants. Animals are just the middlemen and they're doing you a disservice. So they're robbing the food of fiber and phytonutrients. They're concentrating the pesticides and the toxic heavy metals. And then they're also adding in inflammatory uh, compounds like new 5GC or TMAO, these sort of scary sounding things, which are pretty scary, which cause inflammation in the arteries. And what that does is that um, impairs blood flow, which means you know, inhibited oxygen and nutrients to the muscles. And um, so basically you can get all of the nutrients you need, including protein from plants, but it comes in a better package and that package can enhance your athletic ability. And sure enough, six weeks after I switched, um, doing that battling ropes, you know, the 50 foot shipping mm -hmm. rope, yep. um, I, the most I'd ever got was eight minutes straight. And I was training for Uf UFC fights at this time, right? And so I was in pretty good shape. If you got 10 minutes, you got your name on the wall at our gym. And there's a few people that got 20 minutes. Well, six weeks after I went completely plant-based, I got an hour straight to beat the gym record. You know, my hands were bleeding. I had blisters. Um, my my uh, weights went up in the gym. So not only was the research there, uh, and I started coming across other athletes that were in the top of their field across all types of sports, but I also experienced it um, anecdotally myself. So I was really pretty shocked because I thought that we had to have, uh, you know, lots of meat and lots of animal protein to be strong and healthy. Did you make that shift all at once or was it no, slower? So, so uh, over, a, over you know, a couple of months, I was cutting things out, cut out red meat and chicken. Um, I was still doing fish, eggs, and um, dairy. 
And, uh, you know, I just cut that down. And eventually I think um, eggs were the last thing to go. I think dairy went, then fish, then eggs were the last thing to go. And then it was six weeks after that that I, um, you know, I did that ropes uh, training. But so I, I just felt better, felt more energy. Um, yeah, and just felt, felt better overall. Mm. And what's your diet look like today? So, yeah, I'm still, I'm 100% plant-based now. So, um, you know, in the morning I might have uh, oatmeal or overnight oats. You know, you can either cook it in the morning or you can just um, put the milk in, you know, the, the plant-based milk the night before. And that'll have oats, berries, um, hemp seeds, flax seeds, pumpkin, flax seeds, pumpkin seeds, um, maybe some nut butter, um, berries, banana, that type of thing. You can put the plant milk on the night before, just leave it in the fridge and it's ready to go the next day. Or just, you know, cook it like regular oats in the morning, depending if it's, you know, hot or cold outside. Um, then I might do like a lentil pasta, which is higher in protein. Do that with some veggies, maybe some guacamole, you know, maybe a bean and rice burrito, something like that. Um, for dinner so it just it really varies i mean these days if there's you know anything you can get meat based you can get a plant-based burger you can get you can still eat pizza i mean there's there's all sorts of things you can eat but i try and stick with mainly whole foods you know so legumes beans peas lentils nuts and seeds uh fruits and vegetables whole grains you know potatoes that type of thing mm. did you have any challenges with any micronutrients was your diet lacking in anything if, as you've made this transition well, the one thing that you've really got to take, um, and actually 40% of people are low in B12, whether they eat meat or not. Um, so B12 is something that I, I personally think that everybody should be taking. Of course, I'm not a, a registered dietitian, um, but registered dietitians do advocate that people on a plant-based diet certainly take a B12. And B12 isn't created by animals. It's actually created by bacteria in their gut. Um, it's also in the soil. And back in the day, you know, before we started sanitizing things, so before there were pesticides, antibiotics, and that sort of thing, chlorine, uh, you would have got B12 in the water, uh, in the, uh, on the dirt, on your fruits and vegetables, and that type of thing. But now we sanitize everything, which is a good thing, but um, we are low in B12. In fact, even farm animals are fed B12. So omnivores and people that are eating, you know, meats and eggs and that type of thing, as well as fruits and vegetables and plant foods, they are actually supplementing with B12 anyway, it's just indirectly. Um, so yeah, B12, I do take, um, but I was never, you know, I've never been low in anything since I started. Right on, right on. And you've, you've compared this, this, these journeys, this research of nutrition and, and research of fighting or training together. And I find that really fascinating because there are so many correlations. I mean, if you were to get really, really specific about nutrition, you could spend your entire day planning out and cooking and documenting what you're eating. And there, there are people who spend a, a lot of time with that, you know, bodybuilders and, and other folks who may appear on stage for physical reasons will do that. And then you can do the same thing with your martial arts trainer. You can train 16, 20 hours a day if you want and still never master everything. Absolutely. No, that's right. And that, no, there were a lot of parallels. And one of the main things is I think that there's a lot of nonsense in martial arts. And I think there's a lot of nonsense in nutrition advice. So the majority of people get their nutrition advice from the internet. And of course, anyone can claim to be, you know, an expert and you can have people with lots of followings that have a lot of influence. Um, and the same with martial arts, you know, a lot of people find their local gym, it's got some good marketing, it's, it's close by, they go in, and they start believing that that master is the best person, that that art is the best art, you know, and basically, you know, that's just generally not true. And so you've got to dig through all that nonsense and find the essence and find the truth. Um, and so I think, you know, the same mindset definitely applies to both. And there was a lot of parallels there. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, I'm constantly in that first year, I spent over a thousand hours reading peer-reviewed science. Since then, I've been you know, making this documentary, The Game Changers, and I've spent personally over 3,000 hours reading peer-reviewed science, as well as have a full you know, science team uh, backing us up with the chief science advisor, controlling it all, um, controlling the team and managing the team. And so, um, you know, it's just become very clear to me. I think in my martial arts journey, you know, I found like a you know, no one has the absolute truth of everything, right? But I found like, 
you know, you really start re understanding what works and what doesn't. And then in nutrition, you start really realizing what's true and what's not true and, and the influence that the industry has, you know, publishing um, bias studies. You've got to cut through that um, and really start understanding what, what's true and what's not. Yeah. Now, you said a team. What, tell us about this team. What's going on there? Yeah, so we have a team of, well, I mean, that's, so, so I made this documentary called The Game Changers, which actually just came out uh, last night in uh, over 1,500 theaters around the world. Nearly all the, we had 560 to 600 theaters last night in the U.S. Um, it was actually the second most um, viewed film in, in theaters in the whole of the U.S. last night, actually. Oh, cool. I just heard about, oh, yeah, excited. Yeah, so it took a whole team to put that together, right? You can't make a documentary by yourself. Not only do you have the sort of the executive producers and the production team. You know, we've got a bunch of athletes actually on the uh, executive team. So uh, Chris Paul, who's a nine-time All-Star All -Star NBA player. Novak Djokovic, the number one male tennis player in the world. Lewis Hamilton, the five-time uh, Formula One champion. But also, you know, big movie people. James Cameron, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jackie Chan. So you've got the executive team. You've got the team of, you know, editors and videographers and um, director. But then we also have this really strong scientific team that helped with all the research. Um, we're consulting for, you know, $10 million athletes, um, you know, organizations, the military. And so we have a scientific team, you know, with registered dietitians and doctors on board, helping people make a transition towards uh, better nutrition, both for their performance and for their health. And what does it look like if, you know, some high-end athlete, if Le LeBron James calls you up, you know, your team up tomorrow and says, I'm interested in this. And, and let's say, let's say we get past the scientific piece, you know, that he, he, he buys in, he's on board. What's that process look like? How are you working with these people? Yeah. Well, funny you should mention LeBron actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so the, um, we, we just sent the film to his trainer and then his chef uh, requested it. So that's uh, pretty ironic that you asked about LeBron. So, um, yeah, I mean, so basically we'll do a, a, an onboarding session with one, one of our staff where they'll really break down what they're currently eating. Because you, you can't just tell someone, it's not a one-way uh, flow of information. It's like, this is what you're, uh, this is what you're going to eat. You know, first of all, you've got to find out what are they eating and what are their goals, right? Everyone's goals are different. Um, you know, everyone's, what they're eating and their tastes and that sort of thing, the number of calories they require, depending on their sport or their goals. Are they got to lose body fat? Are they just trying to gain muscle? Are they trying to improve their endurance? And so there's really a session that onboards uh, them in that way and, and figures out what are they eating and then figuring out, you know, a, a nutrition plan for them moving forward. And our, our approach is not all or nothing. So it doesn't mean we're not trying to tell people go, ve go vegan or go vegetarian. We're trying to dispel some myths, show some facts, and then um, let people make their own decision. And I do hope that, you know, creates a shift towards more plant-based eating. But you don't have to go all in to get all of the benefits. We like to say all or something rather than all or nothing. Mm. Interesting stuff. And what was the process of making this film? I, I, I've done a little bit of video stuff over the years, and I know how much time goes into it. So tell us about the process of making this film. Oh, yeah. It's, well, first of all, it takes a lot longer to make a film than you'd expect. And there's a lot more work uh, than I ever realized. So... I actually started with a used camera off of Craigslist. Um, you know, I basically woke up one morning as I was digging into this research and thought, I've got to make a film about this. And I partnered up with Joseph Pace, who's the other producer. He's actually been plant-based now for 30 years and um, had some screenwriting experience. And um, so it just took us a long time to, you know, get some funding on board. We did a first round of preliminary filming and we used that footage to then get James Cameron and then our director, Luis Hoyos, who has the most award-winning documentary of all time. Um, and just putting that team together takes a long time. Went to four continents, filmed over 100 people, experts, you know, athletes, um, firefighters, soldiers. And um, it, it's just a long, long process. And then to edit the film, put it together, they say for every 10 minutes of a film, you should allow a month of editing. Uh, so a 90-minute film, you've got nine months of editing. It takes a long, long time. But it's uh, finally out, and we're excited about it. Super cool. And so what's the goal? You've put a lot of time into this, and I suspect a lot of money. And, and yeah, there are ways to commercialize this, and you've got your team. But what's, what's the goal? Why, why did you want to delve into such a 
time consuming and expensive project. Well, I mean, I think to me, I felt like I've been lied to, you know, I hate being lied to. I felt like my parents had told me that we needed meat and animal products to be strong. There's a little scene in the documentary. I was in my Superman outfit, you know, costume when I was five years old. My dad's asked me, you know, what does Superman need to eat to be strong and healthy? And he's talking about meat and I'm talking about lamb and eggs and this type of stuff. And, um, yeah, I just, I, and then the marketing, you know, we're always told you got to eat meat to be strong. And it's, you know, I used to think I knew a lot about nutrition, but I realized that most of my information was coming from blogs and magazines and that sort of thing. And I hadn't really dug in. So once I started digging into the research, I really felt like I'd been lied to. And I really don't like being lied to. And I woke up at two in the morning and thought, I've got to tell the world about this because everyone's being lied to. It's affecting their performance, both athletic performance, also sexual performance, even with blood flow. Um, and, and also people's health. And then the planet is, you know, being destroyed by, um, you know, largely by the, the foods that we eat, which people don't really realize. There can be a huge impact on the planet and environment from the foods that we're eating. Um, and so I just felt like I had to tell the world and, and felt it was important to get the message out. And what's the response been like? It's been oh, surprisingly, um, even in the sort of the younger male demographic, which we thought might push back a bit, it's been overwhelmingly um, positive. Um, you know, we've got guys that are like 250 pounds, 6'3", totally ripped and jacked, that have seen these sort of pre-screenings months ago, have switched over and said, you know, they've gained more muscle, they're, they're feeling great. And so just really shocked at the wide demographic. And then even from like your 15-year-old teenager that's at the gym working out to the 80-year-old um, lady who's her friends have died of heart disease, have made a switch, and they're feeling great. So it's pretty inspiring to see the, the wide demographic that it's um, resonating with. Whenever people talk about vegetarianism, veganism, plant-based, et cetera, have you had any, I guess, pushback or, or maybe even threats? Is, is anybody trying to derail putting out this message? You know, we really haven't had as much pushback as we thought. You know, the industry... Uh, Although I think in the past they've done things like there was the Oprah Winfrey um, lawsuit where she talked bad about meat in, in a very minimal way, actually, and there was a lawsuit. So, you know, do I think there's a chance that we're going to get sued? Um, will there be some threats? Yeah, I think, I think there will be. Um, however, I think things are changing rapidly. Even in this last six months or a year, things are changing. The meat industry is not only investing in these new plant-based meat companies, but they're also starting to develop their own plant-based meat products because they see where the money's going. They see the way that the, tre the trends are going in this direction. And so they're sort of switching from this, um, largely they're switching from this mindset of like really promoting meat. I think that's starting to change now. Um, so overall, I think the, uh, the risk of, you know, death threats and lawsuits uh, are gonna, is going to minimize. So let's circle this back to martial arts. Let's, let's start plugging some of these things together. You know, you, you talked about some pretty tangible aspects of what you're advocating here with, with health, with muscle development, et cetera. But the folks listening here, they're, they're martial artists. They're looking at what's going to be better for them in and outside of their training. So when we consider them if if they call up you know if you get somebody who's calling up and they're not a professional fighter they're someone who's really passionate about their karate training or their kung fu training what would you tell them um i mean in terms of their nutrition you mean or in terms of training as well uh let's start with nutrition but but yeah all the above yeah i mean in terms of nutrition um you know, actually, what we've done is we've put out uh, lots of free resources on our website so that people can come and you know look at recipes, look at um, tips on how to make a switch, tips on eating out, and that sort of thing. Um, so we want to do that. We have a nonprofit that's putting all of that information out, actually. Um, but I would say, you know, think about what your sport is, and if you know, hardworking muscles run primarily on glycogen. So you can, so you can run, um, you know, slow, steady pace. Um, burning body fat pretty well, but if you've got an intense, um, an intense sport like martial arts, then you want to get enough carbs in to replenish glycogen stores, and to do that, you know that's primarily coming from plants, right? So, I would just start focusing on getting more whole plant foods into your diet, 
so that you're fueling your body properly. If you're not fueling your body properly, it's not going to operate its best. And that's certainly not what you want if you're trying to become, you know, an athlete of any sort or just have any energy throughout the day to work at the office or play with your kids, but certainly in martial arts. I mean, martial arts is really, you know, if, you, if you're going a few rounds, there's, it's a lot of intensity and, and you really need those carbs to, to fuel yourself. So again, not trying to tell people to go vegan or go vegetarian, but make sure you're getting plenty of, uh, of carbohydrate rich plant foods in, in their in their whole source, right? Like you don't want to go with sugar and, you know, Oreos and Pepsi are, are vegan, but they're not, and they're made from plants uh, originally, right? But they're not healthy food. So trying to encourage eating people more, more fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, basically. Absolutely. Makes sense. So what's your training look like now? What do you, do, do you even have time to train? <laughs> Yeah, like we've, really very, we've been we've been very busy you know we've been traveling around with the film and um doing the distribution and, and building the these resources for people but no i still uh, still get my training in and so you know I, I like to hit the gym you know keep the the strength up doing the weights like deadlift squats you know that type of thing but also a lot of rotational exercises so the problem with a lot of weights exercise at the gym it's very linear right you're pushing and pulling but if you look at most sports and especially fighting there's a lot of rotational um exercises there's a lot of rotational implementation so whether you're punching or throwing so really working you know throwing medicine balls against the wall um and then twisting doing the wood chop with the cable um really focusing on a lot of rotational uh, stuff because that's where your power comes from that's where a lot of your moves are going to um exist in that space um, so that's sort of hitting at the gym. And then I like to keep the high intensity interval training up. So sprints on the steps, um, you know, sprinting to the top, um, jogging, or walking back down, sprinting to the top again, things like that. And then obviously continuing the martial arts training, whether it's, um, getting on the mat, doing jujitsu again, I just love jujitsu and, and grappling for a whole body workout. And it's also just so cerebral. It's really like a physical game of chess. So I like getting that in and then still occasionally doing some, um, you know, edge weapon training, empty hand against edge weapons or edge weapon on edge weapon, blunt instruments, working multiple attackers, you know, it's really mixing it up and, and keeping it very varied basically. Mm, mm. Tell us more about that, that weapons training. Is it that, you know, Filipino martial arts influenced or is that coming from somewhere else? Uh, both actually. So, you know, um, Paul Vunak also, and, and of course, Dan and Asanto as well have a, a large um, Filipino martial arts influence in their teachings. And so, you know, I'm a full instructor in Kali as well. Um, and so there's some influence from there, um, but also just really, again, researching your own experience and absorbing from different uh, styles and systems, develop some of our own uh, stuff or tweak other people's stuff that we're developing um, for knife defense. Um, and this is the type of stuff that I teach to like, you know, the special forces or Navy SEALs, um, Green Berets, and then other government agencies like the U.S. Marshals or Federal Air Marshals. Um, so it's really a conglomeration of synergistic uh, styles and techniques brought together to develop one. So I don't like to think of any one style. Even Jeet Kune Do, people start to, you know, say, well, Jeet Kune Do is the way because that's bringing in things. But that sort of became its own system as well in a way, which was not right. what Bruce Lee was inten intending. Um, so just really not worrying too much about labeling or styles, um, but just learning from everybody, trying to have a white belt mentality, you know, rather than a black belt mentality where you can really be open to learning new information, having that open, empty cup, mm. you know, so that you can r absorb information. So not really focusing on any one style. We talk often about that white belt mentality on the show and how personally, I think it's the difference between the best martial artists and the ones who are not quite on their level. Those who reach the, the pinnacle, who, those who are the absolute best seem to have spent a lot of time learning from other people and, and just being open to being a white belt, to being terrible, to finding a path forward. Would you agree? No, absolutely. Yeah, I think when people think that they've you know, when they've got their black belt, they think they've made it, they start getting out of shape, they're not as open-minded, they think they know everything. And so, yeah. you know, I think recognize where you've come from, where you're at, but, but also really just stay open-minded and learn from other people. You can learn from students sometimes, you know, sometimes my students are teaching me things. Absolutely. Um, and so just, you know, that white belt mentality is key. Yeah. Yeah. It, 
one of the questions I like to ask, and so I'll, I'll, I'll throw this at you now. Imagine we have a time machine and a teleporter kind of rolled into one, and you could go anywhere in the world, anywhere in time to train with someone else. Who would that be? I think it's got to be Bruce Lee. You know, I uh, think... Um, I figured. Uh, yeah. <laughs> out of anybody, um, that would be fantastic. Uh, just, just to pick his... I mean, even just having conversations with him, I think would be amazing, but, um, but also training with him as well. And you've spent a lot of time researching and reading his work, and I'm, I'm going to guess more than most people. So you've probably got a pretty good handle on his philosophy and a lot of other things. What would you hope to accomplish training with him? Would there be certain aspects of your training that you would say, you know, Bruce Lee is the best person to teach me this? Or is it more that you're a fan? Uh, it's more, I think I'd like to pick his brain deeper on the philosophies, um, you know, especially later on in his life because he was constantly evolving and just sort of try to figure out where he would have gone next, you know, because had he stayed alive, you know, people start saying, well, would he have done well in the mixed martial arts competition, you know, at his weight? Well, of course, you know, we've, we've learned a lot since then. There's a lot more information out there now especially with, uh, you know, the, the grappling aspects. Um, but people forget, you know, people think that the mixed martial arts is, the sport of mixed martial arts is, is, you know, they say as real as it gets. And it is, in terms of competition, it is real as it gets. But you've got to remember that Bruce Lee was talking about headbutting and eye gouging and biting and um, kicking the groin and all these sorts of things. And, and you've also got to remember that, yeah, he was a pretty small guy in terms of his weight. But when you when you don't allow eye jabs and kicking the groin and biting and this sort of thing, strength and size becomes more of a factor. So when you allow those things, speed and agility and timing and line from realization and footwork, all of these attributes become uh, more important actually. And so, you know, it's not really about whether Bruce Lee would have done well. I think that he would, had he had the current information, he was certainly extremely athletic. Um, I think he would have done very well in the UFC, but you've got to remember that's not his mindset. And, and the same for me, you know, fighting in the UFC and winning the ultimate fighter was just sort of one aspect. My main focus has always been on realistic self-defense and, and training people um, to really defend themselves if they need, if they need to. Um, but uh, I think that's, that's the difference there as well. And so just picking his, his mind, you know, about his, his philosophy and where I think he would have headed next. Sure, sure. Let's look to the future. You know, let's look out five years, 10 years, as far as you want to look into the horizon. What are you hoping to accomplish? What's keeping you motivated? What are your goals? What's your training look like? Yeah, I mean, I think I want to keep, uh, you know, I, to me now, you know, I'm 41. I'm no longer competing. And I'm still teaching occasionally, but I'm also heavily focused on promoting, you know, uh, better eating for people. So in terms of my training, I just want to sort of maintain, stay in shape. Uh, keep learning new things and maintain flexibility because I feel that's one of the things as you get older that uh, diminishes. Keep up my endurance and my fitness and stay healthy so I can play with my kids um, and not go too crazy, you know, not um, take too many risks like I perhaps would have done in the day, like tapping out too late or just going, you know, 100% way too often. So, um, you know, I don't want to do, you know, go too hard anymore, too often at least. Um, and then, you know, the rest of my life, I really feel like I want to keep promoting, um, you know, healthy eating because I think uh, there's a lot of people dying unnecessarily, prematurely from the major chronic diseases, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, that sort of thing. I think people aren't performing at their best. You know, people can perform really well, but it's not necessarily because of what they're eating. It's often in spite of it, and especially when they're younger. I think I can help people have more longevity in their athletic careers. So just helping other people really, and then also you know, encouraging plant-based eating also for the, the planet as well. Mm. Cool, cool stuff. Awesome. Now, if people want to learn more about you or the film, find you on social media, where would they go? Yeah, so uh, the film is, uh, there's a website, gamechangersmovie.com. Uh, the Instagram and Facebook handles are Game Changers Movie. On Twitter, it's GC Movie. And then if they want to follow me personally uh, on Instagram, it's uh, at Lightning Wilkes. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here today. And one last thing as we head off, what parting words would you give to the folks listening today? I would just say, you know, 
keep an open mind in your training, learn from other people, and um, try to figure out what those immutable principles are of combat so that you have that lens to look through. And then also feel your body well. You know, treat your body like it's a machine and fuel that machine with the best fuel possible. Because if you want optimal results, you need to have the optimal fuel. It's not often we have someone on the show who approaches everything they do in their lives with such intellectual dedication. The idea that Mr. Wilkes spent so much time researching and understanding the way combat works and then the way nutrition works. I can really appreciate that because that's the attitude that I bring to a lot of the things that I do. Now with this movie and this mission to help people from a nutrition perspective, I hope he has nothing but success. So thank you so much, sir, for coming on the show. I really appreciated our time together. If you want to learn more about today's episode, head to whistlekickmarshartsradio.com, get the transcript, get the links, see the photos, and maybe check out some other episodes while you're there. Feel free to share this or any other episode. It's one of the best ways that you can help support Whistlekick and Martial Arts Radio. Help us grow. Help us reach more people. Help us maintain our number one ranking. If you go to whistlekick.com, don't forget, Podcast 15 gets you 15% off. And remember, you can follow us on social media, see all the things that we've got going on, our original memes, content, motivation, you name it. We are at Whistlekick on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. My personal email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And I look forward to hearing from you in some way. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.